try to give an idea in the time that I have. So the topic is how come not every patient with diabetes develop vascular complication? Is it gene, environment or drug? I'm sure it's all of it. But I'm supposed to give you the, uh, the account of the genes that are uh, going to be contributing to this. And to bring down this vast topic to 10 minute outline, I have decided to talk on four important points that should go on as a message um, to what genes are going to contribute one is a vein diagram of overlapping circles. This is a very interesting thing to know and to keep on highlighting to ourselves to remember when we are uh, kind of getting obsessed with one parameter that is glucose or that is lipid or that is weight or, or, or a number of us, a number of it. How do we know it's genes that is not uh, responsible for one-to-one -one relationship? And if it is genes, what are the genes? What is genetic is inherited but not exactly the gene. That is also something that is important for us to know. And why are we talking about it? What is going to be the clinical implication of such an information? Looking at the first point of Venn diagram of overlapping circles, this is not uh, exactly to the scale or percentage, but just a creative to make you understand that on one circle, we have hyperlysemia, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, we have obesity. We have microvascular complications and we have macrovascular complications. And these circles are overlapping. They are not either inclusive of each other and they are not similar to each other or same to each other. They are not exclusive. They are not inclusive. They are overlapping. How? Some um, numbers that I would like to give is 35% of Americans with diabetes are at risk of developing proteinuria, chronic renal deficiency and end-stage renal disease. Rest of the 65% are not. Half of the patients with poor glycemic control develop diabetic nephropathy. Whereas some patients in spite of having good control uh, develop it. So there is this is again an overlapping uh, issue. Majority of individuals with diabetes do develop background retinopathy. But not all of them will develop nephropathy. So not all microvascular complications also can be included in one circle. So there are overlapping circles over there also. Family members with diabetes, even in absence of clinical nephropathy, demonstrate a biopsy pattern of glomerular involvement, which is similar to a family member with diabetes. So there is definitely something that is inherited or that is uh, getting transferred from genes. Now, how do we know which genes? So this is the typical way of uh, studying genetics. Those who work in genetics might find this very basic. But those who are doing mainly clinical practice, I try to uh, make it under, uh, understandable that how do we exactly know which gene is affected. So this is called as linkage approach in which we identify a patient, we identify gene and we keep on following the trail in the family to know whether the gene is really responsible for the outcome or not. And this is, this is called a genetic linkage analysis. This is genetic association analysis in which the whole population is uh, uh, studied and then we fi find whether a particular disease has more common appearance of a particular gene or a genetic sequence compared to the matching population. So th there are genetic linkage analysis and there are genetic association analysis. When diabetic complications are studied, the genetic linkage analysis still now has identified these genes. There are many more studies suggesting some other genes also. But this is from one study that these, this is the list. Fortunately, we don't have to currently remember it and I don't have to explain it in details. But what I want you to know is that we can either find out a single gene or a, a single sequence of uh, DNA and we can find, we can replicate that particular gene into the family members or a genome wide screen in which the whole genome, we, what we call as whole genome sequencing is studied in a particular family and the family tree. And then we find out whether that particular, what are the genes that can be picked up and then they can be followed. In association analysis, there is another long list of genes that are identified to be commonly present in patients with diabetes and especially in those who develop a particular kind of uh, vascular complication. Here also, it can be done with either a candidate gene or a whole genome sequence analysis. 
in this single nucleotide polymorphism what we called as snps or snps are coming up as one of the most important markers that can be identified easily right now um, we do have an option of doing a, a whole genome sequencing in a given patient who is clinically um, clinically assessed and clinically evaluated where i practice it costs somewhere around 16 to 17000 rupees which is not exactly very cheap but also not impossible so if if required in particular patient this can be practiced in clinical uh, practice also now there is something called as missing hereditary that means that the genes that we know capture only 10% of risk and addition of this list of genes to the so the in genes that predict the risk of a particular patient of developing complication does not change even uh, as an addition uh, when we add the genetic information to the risk engines of clinical uh, parameters so is there something that is inherited as same sequence but it not expressed in the same way i always like to say uh, in my presentations that the genetic uh, sequence similarity between a human being and a gorilla is 98% and one human being to another human being is 99.9% so it is not exactly the structure of the gene it is also how the gene is expressed that will matter for example a same person with the same gene will have different risk of a disease called skin cancer depending on the sunlight exposure and it doesn't only remain to a sunlight exposure or the environment which is outside so we have a genome that is inherited from the previous generation there are certain exposomes these are collective terms used for everything that we are exposed to in utero in development in reproductive year in later phases of life with our family with our uh, environment with our friends with our colleagues whatever we are exposed to will definitely affect how a particular sequence of dna which we call as gene will express itself and this is something which is called as epigenetic now there are three important parameters where genetics are studied we will not go into the details but why i want to talk about epigenetic is because unlike the genetic change or the dna sequence epigenetic changes are modifiable and modifiable to a great extent even though we cannot change the genes that parents have given us we can definitely change the way that genes get expressed depending on what is our health goal similar the same horse the same rider with two different roles on your left side you can see shivaji maharaj on your right side you can see sambhaji maharaj the same horse the same hero and presenting or using the horse in a different way with a different goal and that is what the same genes that we have received from our parents with the kind of health goal that we have we can change the expression that a gene can cause now this can be voluntary this can happen because of uh, unavoidable uh, metabolic uh, exposures or environmental exposures we know metabolic memory long time back if you are exposed to glucose today you can have issues so if we make something favorable this time we can have good results in future so we don't have to look at it only negatively the favorable changes in epigenetics are also possible which can have a long term positive outcomes from the health point of view so again a list of epigenetic changes that you know uh, can be affected if you are interested you can go back there are a lot of good publications on this coming to the implications of genetic studies what are we clinically looking at when we are talking about genes we understand the mechanism of a disease when we are studying the genes so more genetic information more we understand how a disease uh, affects us and how we can modify it identify at risk individuals we don't have to manage everybody to hb1c of 6.5 we can target those who are at a higher risk of developing complications to identify the modifiable gene and environmental effect and epigenetic changes and to favorably uh, affect them to have a novel therapeutic approach in future is something that we are going to achieve by studying genetics with that i'll come back to a summary uh, i hope i am not overshooting the time but in last four lines i would like to summarize what i spoke first is we know that it's not as simple and linear as high blood glucose is equal to complications and giving a drug to reduce the glucose and preventing the complications there are multiple overlapping circles which include hyperglycemia other fuel fuel uh, abnormal fuel metabolism abnormalities genetic epigenetic changes and this overlapping circles 
would tell us that we need to take every patient uh, as one point of time. We have identified a lot of genes which are responsible for uh, which are responsible for different effect of different glycemia in different patients. But right now, on the list of genes, we are not able to predict the risk. We need to work more on it. By working more on it, we know that the same genetic sequence can have different expressions in different people that can be explained either by epigenetic changes or changes in the exposome, that is the environmental exposure. And we need to keep on studying to know more is what I would uh, end by my talk with. Thank, Thank you so you. much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Anjali, for timely finishing up your deliberation. Excellent deliberation. You have talked about the epigenetic factor responsible also. That, in fact, it starts inside the utero, and it can be easily be prevented. And uh, Thank you. We'll wait for the uh, discussion at the end of the session. I would like to uh, refer now to Dr. Desai for the next session to pick up. Thank you, Dr. Desai. Yeah, right. Uh... So I think, do we have a change in the speaker here? I think it was going to be Dr. Sunil Kota. Yeah, we, it's Dr. Sunil Kota. Yeah, but the, the introduction is Dr. Of Unfortunately, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sunil Kota is not being able to hear. So in place of him, I will try to deliver. Yeah, so okay. uh, now we have our next speaker is Dr. Dharmendra Panchal. Uh, is a diabetes, obesity, and metabolism, and endocrine physician. He has done his MBBS from Ahmedabad. He is MD from also and from Ahmedabad. He is a chairman of Dr. Diab Diabetes Digital Diabetes Care Program. He is a diabetologist at Diacare Sabarmati Ahmedabad. He is assistant professor of diabetes and endocrine at Dr. Sa Medical College Ahmedabad. He is consultant endocrinologist. And uh, he is a member of so many organizations. And he is a regional faculty for certificate course of Evidence-Based Diabetes Management by PHFI is a regional faculty for advanced course in diabetology by RSSDI. is invited speaker at various national and international conferences and has published so many papers in national and international textbooks also. What he's going to speak on is influence of environment on development of diabetic complications. Uh, Dr. Zarvendra Panchal. Yeah. Thank you, respected chairpersons uh, for kind introduction so would like to fulfill the job of dr sunil keta who is unfortunately not with us right now uh, so of course after nice deliberation by dr anli how come not every patient with diabetes develops vascular complications she delivered that genes may be responsible but not the only genes are responsible and that's why we always say that it's a complex interplay between genetic predisposition and environmental influence, and which will lead to progressive deterioration in the structure and function of the cardiovascular tissue. There are many evidence that suggests that environmental factor and lifestyle, they both play a major uh, dominant role in cardiovascular disease development. Even in absence of large genetic changes, CVD risk in a population can be affected by change in environment and moving to a new environment could substantially modify the CVD risk disease. You can take the examples of Indians in India and Indians in UK. You will find there is a vast difference in cardiovascular risk and cardiovascular disease. How the environmental agent can lead to these through the exposure and through thermal absorption inhalation or di indigestion, initial response will be either translocation or systemic absorption or any sort of say, receptor activation or through metabolism, which will have its effects on at molecular, cellular level, as well as uh, which will generate target and organ responses through variety of mechanism and eventually which may lead to thrombosis, atherosclerosis or alteration in cardiac structure and which may end up in ischemic event, arrhythmia, or cardiomyopathy or heart failure. So, in general, this is the way where uh, this can affect. If we talk about human environment, we can deliver or we can divide it into natural environment, social environment and personal environment. We we'll talk more detail in natural and social environment, living behind personal environment. If we talk about nature environment, it is a circadian rhythm, season, attitude and green spaces. 
which affects circadian rhythm of course we call it day night cycle and which is a uh, fundamental feature of nature and worm it controls both the cardiovascular health and function we know that heart rate and blood pressure are lowest at the night and during sleep and begin to rise before we wake up and this circadian use it regulates the expression of cardiovascular genes and the abundance of cardiovascular protein as well as this neuroregulatory hormones which regulate the cardiovascular functions so it is at most important and disturbance in this sleep cycle can increase the risk of diabetes obesity and hypertension we particularly see in shift workers trans meridian flight crews patients with sleep apnea and other sleep disturbances and even short term circadian misalignment increases the blood pressure and inflammation as well as post prandial blood glucose level and insulin so incidence of adverse cardiovascular event and its severity varies with time of the day we all know that the study suggests that myocardial infarction occurs most frequently between 6 to 12 pm mostly between 3 to 6 am and 3 to 3 times more common likely to occur in early morning than at night myocardial infarction occur in the middle of the night are larger angioplasties perform at night are less successful this is what the some studies have suggested and it is linked to the intrinsic clock mechanism not only the stress of waking up it is reported that when in new geographical location frequency of cardiovascular event in traveler peaks for a few days at time that is correspond to their time zone of origin not the where they are it is also evident that significant cardiovascular benefit could be derived from maintaining diurnal rhythm treating sleep disorder restoring neuroendocrine hormone profile by either uh, regularizing the schedules of time keepers like light activity eating and we may derive the benefit by targeting clock protein or therapies seasons we know the change of the season will lead to a sir change in sunlight exposure change in physical activity change in human behavior feeding behavior uh, in both northern and southern hemisphere the level of blood pressure the plasma hdl ldl glucose they are slightly higher in winter than in summer and it is reported that most patient on statin therapy they achieve their ldl target in summer rather than in winter more so it also known that winter mortality spikes both in young and old age so it's not the age it's the season which is affecting if we talk about effect of cold temperature it exacerbate cardiovascular disease due to exacerbation of pre existing disease or exacerbation of respiratory infection which may trigger the acute phase response this cold temperature may lead to destabilization of the vulnerable lesions which may lead to plaque rupture or occlusive thrombosis more frequently in winter the ambient cold temperature increases vascular resistance as well as blood pressure cold ambient temperature also increases coronary artery resistance and induce coronary vasospasm which may be linked to the myocardial infarction and acute presentation of aortic aneurysm it is also known that on other side high temperature heat waves in different region of the world they are associated with increased cardiovascular mortality even temperature variability a 10 degree fahrenheit increase in the same day temperature has found to be associated with increased risk of hospitalization ischemic heart disease and ischemic stroke and even this era of global warming it is affecting and it is responsible for global burden of cardiovascular disease which is continuously increasing if we talk about sunlight high level of exposure to sunlight in early life it delays cardiovascular disease by 0.6 to 2.1 years and the time spending outdoor presumably by leading greater sunlight exposure inversely related to the cardiovascular mortality and extends of this uh, relation it may be related to the vitamin d and this is as equal as a uh, a similar to the smoking prevalence sunlight exposure is related mainly to vitamin d but apart from that melanin uh, pigmentation of the skin also affects where dark skin requires longer exposure to sunlight to synthesize the same amount of vitamin d as those with the light skin apart from this uh, radiation by ultraviolet b 
because uh, uh, consequently the ability to synthesize vitamin D is also affected by the time of the day, season, and latitude. Greater prevalence of vitamin D deficiency is observed in fall and winter rather than summer and spring. Increased distance from the equator, there is progressive increase in blood pressure, which is also correlated with the gradual fall in ultraviolet B radiation. And it is reported that exposure to ultraviolet B radiation, skin tanning in saloon treatment of its higher dose of vitamin D2 reduces the blood pressure. Vitamin D regulates the cardiovascular function. You know that cardiovascular tissue has vitamin D receptor, which regulates nearly 200 genes and 3% of the human genome is regulated by vitamin D. So you see that environment factor sunlight, which affects vitamin D and which will also affect the genetic representation. And in human, vitamin D deficiency is also associated with the increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events like myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, and sudden cardiac death. Not only ultraviolet B radiation, it is ultraviolet A radiation, which is also uh, responsible and which is uh, useful for rapid and sustained decrease in the blood pressure. It is attributed to ultraviolet A induced release of nitric oxide from the cutaneous photolabile anoderivatives. We know that human skin contains high level of nitrites and nitrosol. And because this UVA penetrates the epidermis, it will lead to generate significant level of nitrite in the blood and it will enhance the local level of uh, metastable nitrosol compound, which then uh, distributed via blood circulation subsequently, which evoke the systemic response to decrease the blood pressure. So here it is a visible light which is responsible for circadian rhythm, ultraviolet B, which will be responsible for vitamin D synthesis and ultraviolet A which will be responsible for blood pressure regulation. So sunlight is one of the most important environmental factors. If we talk about altitude, uh, nearly 400 million people live in the area of uh, 5,000 feet or above sea level. We you see the native Tibetans and uh, Nepalese Sapa, Serpas, they are the best adapted to the high altitudes. And they rarely exhibit systolic hypertension and have lower level of cholesterol and apoprotein B. They also have lower pulmonary pressure in response to exercise and with less increase in ventilation rate and better preservation of cardiac output. So difference in diet, physical activity, air pollution may be responsible, but utmost important is the stable difference in the natural environment. Another environmental factor is green space, which is associated with lower level of stress, diabetes, stroke, and cardiovascular disease. Children living in greener areas have lower level of asthma, blood pressure, and insulin resistance. Adult residents proximal to greener areas have been associated with better general health, enhanced social support and physical activity, which ultimately results in lower level of stress and other cardiovascular factor. It is speculated that some of the behavior uh, beneficial cardiovascular effect might be related to decrease in the level of uh, local air pollution or increased proximity of walking space. But it also suggests there is a primordial bond between nature and health and which may be responsible for this benefit. If we talk about social environment, we will talk in terms of built environment, pollution, environmental noise, social network and socioeconomic status. The artificial, non-natural living space, they, pre they may be able to or they may be helpful to prevent the disease by creating sanitary, climate regulation, safe spaces, but also they may promote the disease by generating unconductive living conditions. Multiple sources of vulnerability that are related to the characteristics of built environment, stress, no nutritional resources, lack of place for exercise, decreased interaction with nature and exposure to multiple environmental toxin polymer, which may be responsible for increased cardiovascular disease prevalence within community. I'm sorry so to interrupt you, Dr. Pantel. Dr. Pantel, please sum up within a minute or so. Yes, we will sum up in five minutes. Five minutes is too much. You need to... Yeah. You need to take another two minutes. Okay. Please. Okay. So clear as Thank impact you. in environment could be seen with the obesity pollution. We all know that there are the different source of pollution. One thing I would like to highlight: we all believe that uh, air pollution is responsible for respiratory disease, but seventy to eighty percent of premature deaths due to air pollution leads to cardiovascular causes and cardiovascular death. And this is the way where it will increase. It will cause the cardiovascular disease, which is explained in this. 
uh, environmental noise. Again, one important factor would like to say that increase in noise by 10 decibel has been associated with 8% increase in cardiovascular disease risk. And it is suggested that by decreasing 5 decibel noise reduction in environment, we can reduce the hypertension by 1.2 million and CSD cases by 2.79 lakh per year in US alone. Social networking, one of the important thing, the genetic which Madam talk about, FTO gene strongly associated with obesity, but person carrying this gene have a 67% increased risk of obesity while compared to 171% increasing risk of obesity by having just friend who is obese. So choose your friend wisely. And if one sibling is obese, chances of being second sibling obese is by 40%. Socioeconomic status also related with the level of education, which may be related to hypertension and other cardiovascular disease. Personal environment, nutrition, it must be talked uh, in the other sessions also in detail, but we all know that there are personal food choices, dietary pattern and dietary tradition and diet at all affects the major cardiovascular risk factor at all the aspects. Physical activity, again, most important. And inactivity is in the human is strongly associated with CVD risk, where it increases coronary risk by 45%, increase stroke by 60%, increase hypertension by 30%, and type 2 diabetes by 50%. Smoking, again, we all know that it is one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And this way, I will summarize that CVD is also uh, one of the environmental diseases. And we must have integrated environmental view if we want to prevent the cardiovascular disease and save our uh, generation further. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, that was uh, mm -hmm. wonderful, Dr. Jarbindra Panchal. And uh, I think because of the lack of time, we can move on to another speaker's talk. Uh, so, Dr. Ripun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deshrai. Uh, I think Meena Chabra, Dr. Meena Chabra needs no introduction. She was the judge in the previous session. I have been listening to her. Wonderful lady, very dynamic lady. She is very active in our CME group also. Over to you, Meena. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen. So, good morning. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so this is uh, actually a three sided talk to the same problem. And I agree wholeheartedly with my first speaker that uh, all of them play a role the gene, the environment. But what I would like to reiterate, because I have been given the job today is that drugs play an important role irrespective of the environment and the gene. My second speaker drifted away from the topic. The topic is not that environment increases cardiovascular risk, but the topic is that a diabetic patient in an adverse environment can develop vascular complications earlier. So I think uh, there was a little, uh, you know, that that topic was not what it was. Yeah. So we practice evidence-based medicine. There is no doubt, as has been mentioned by my revered colleagues, that genetics and epigenetics play an important role. We all know the Indian phenotype. We also know the uh, change in epigenetics. But data today shows that drugs are very important. Stopping smoking, lifestyle, and reducing obesity, of course, play an important role. But ironically, we have drugs to support these. How many of our patients are able to follow lifestyle? Are we going to wait for lifestyle modification alone? Or will we add drugs with enough evidence from several randomized controlled trials that, and we have clinching evidence on improving all-cause morbidity and mortality with these drugs. So my job today is not to belittle genetics and epigenetics or the role of environment, but to reiterate that with the help of drugs, we can actually help the patient live a life longer and without vascular complications. So I'm talking about a type 2 diabetic patient. When the patient is diagnosed, the issues are obviously his blood pressure, his cholesterol, his uh, glycemia, his weight, 
as the diabetes advances, we have several other comorbidities and risk factors which contribute to the development of cardiovascular disease. Now, drugs can address most of these risk factors. If I talk about hypertension, better control of hypertension can reduce vascular complications. If I talk about uh, dyslipidemia, better control of LDL. Now we have drugs even to control LP little a, another risk factor. So if we can control, we have enough evidence to prove that we can decrease cardiovascular mortality. We, we also have drugs like ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And now we have the wonderful SGLT2 inhibitors, which can decrease not just the progression of macroprotein, microproteinuria to macroproteinuria, but also decrease hard endpoints, renal endpoints like uh, end-stage renal disease, the need for dialysis, and the need for renal transplant. So diabetes definitely produces oxidative stress, inflammation, cellular apoptosis, may lead to cardiomyocyte loss and nephron loss. So this is a continuum, the microvascular and the macrovascular complications. Now, why do the, uh, diabetes, diabetics develop cardiovascular disease? Obviously, genetics and epigenetics are important, like we mentioned, but isn't obesity a um, greater risk? So we have the traditional risk factors and certain non-traditional risk factors. Isn't it our job to control the traditional risk factors, which we have huge number of drugs in our armamentorium? Can we address hypertension? Can we address the raised LDL? Should we address the dyslipidemia and the uh, hypercoagulable state? Yes, we should. So we can address the traditional risk factors, and that is my premise. Of course, diabetes increases risk of both micro and macrovascular complications. We know that uh, atherosclerosis happens because of inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, and the earliest marker of endothelial dysfunction is urinary microalbuminuria. Now, consequences of delayed intervention. What if I listen to my previous speakers and just believe that lifestyle modification and environmental modification, wait for the patient to lose weight? Am I doing good to the patient? No. A patient with an HbA1c of greater than 7, not receiving intensive therapy within one year, vis-a-vis -vis patients with HbA1c less than 7, who received intensive therapy before one year of diagnosis, just see. So at the end of 5.3 years, there was a significantly increased risk of myocardial infarction by 67%, significant increase in risk of stroke and heart failure by 51 and 64%, and a composite cardiovascular disease risk of 62% by delayed intervention. So a bad glycemic legacy. So yes, lifestyle modification, yes, trying to change the environment, but the bad glycemic legacy has to be taken care of. And this drives the risk of complications. So the risk of complication, uh, the risk of development of cardiovascular disease in comparison with Europeans, definitely Indians will develop a decade earlier. 10% of the MIs will occur in Indians less than age of 40. 52% of cardiovascular disease deaths occur under the age of 70. And in the inter-heart study, it was not only lifestyle, although lifestyle factors were included in the inter-heart study, but dyslipidemia appeared to be the strongest contributor to acute MI in Indians. So doctors, my premise is address the dyslipidemia. If you reduce the LDL by 39 milligram percent, you can reduce cardiovascular events, major coronary events. You can reduce the incidence of coronary revascularization. You can decrease the any uh, vascular death by 24%, any death, all-cause death by 24%. Will you deprive your patient of statins, thinking that he can raise the good cholesterol by taking good fats and decrease the LDL cholesterol by walking? No. Lifestyle modification and environment are important, but we have several randomized controlled trials which have proven beyond doubt that cardiovascular mortality can be decreased uh, with statins. Now, coming to the SGLT2 inhibitors, these drugs which push the glucose in the urine cause glucosuria. Because of glucosuria, there is not along with it, there is some amount of natriuresis or osmotic diuresis. So what do they do? They if decrease effective blood volume. They decrease total body weight because you lose glucose in the urine. There is a negative calorie balance. If our patient is not able to control his food intake and we are in trouble, can't we create a negative calorie balance by pushing glucose in the urine? If I push 70 grams of glucose in the urine with SGLT2 inhibitors, for every gram of glucose, the patient loses four calories. 
With the loss of about 70 grams of glucose in the urine, the patient loses about 240 calories. Isn't it sensible? How many of my patients am I able to motivate to decrease 250 calories from their diet? It's difficult. So again, my premise is these drugs, they also help in LV remodeling. They improve cardiovascular outcome. So again, type 2 diabetes in the heart, the postulated mechanism they increase, uh, that in diabetics, there is increase of fat oxidation as GLT-2 decreases that. They, there is a decrease in glucose oxidation and they decrease increase glucose oxidation. So there are several advantages of using SGLT-2 and there are enough trials to prove that Dapacana and Empa all decrease heart failure hospitalization. They empagliflozin reduces cardiovascular mortality. What other hard point than death? So if death can be prevented by the use of these drugs, why deprive the patient? Of course, I again reiterate lifestyle modification shall go hand in hand with drugs. What about renal outcomes? They are better. We have, uh, again, hard data from the CKD trials that dapagliflozin decreases progression of micro to macroproteinuria, also decreases uh, hard endpoints um, like the development of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine. So if you look at empagliflozin and cardiovascular and renal benefits, 14% redu reduction in 3P maze, death by any cause, 32%, cardiovascular death by 38%, nephropathy 39%, and renal composite by 46%. So such wonderful drugs, and I can't deprive them, my patients of these drugs. Now, these are the comparison of studies. I have only 10 minutes. Empareg outcome, most of the patients for secondary prevention, but in declare, most patients for primary prevention, but still there was a reduction in heart failure hospitalization and reduction in progression of nephropathy. Then we come to the GLP-1 receptor agonist, wonderful drugs if we can use them. Again, in the both Rewind trial as well as the uh, LEADER trial, we have found that there is a first occurrence of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke in the time to event analysis in patients with type 2 diabetes and high cardiovascular risk, definitely liraglutide decreased cardiovascular mortality. Same as with the uh, trial with the dulaglutide. This is a meta-analysis of all the trials. If you can see most of them, and now we are waiting for oral semaglutide, which will be in the Indian market. And you can see all the trials here, re reduction in cardiovascular mortality, reduction in 3P maze. Now coming to insulin, an early direct effect of insulin on microvas microvascular function in the muscle has been seen. Insulin has vasodilatory properties. It augments muscle blood flow, reduces insulin res re resistance. So favorable effects of local expression of plasminogen activator inhibitor one, insulin retards fibrinolysis in the coronary vasculature. Are we going to deprive the patient of insulin? No, we are not. So again, we have trials with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and so we have a trial with the combination of a neprilysin inhibitor, sacubitril, and an angiotensin receptor blocker, Valsartan, because the combined ARB neprilysin inhibitor was developed to address two pathophysiological mechanisms of heart failure, activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and decreased sensitivity to natriuretic peptide. And these two drugs address that. So will I deprive my patient of the, these drugs which have hard clinical data? No, I won't. So my premise is while some patients may benefit from interventions based on changes in lifestyle, for the majority of type 2 diabetic patients, the environment and lifestyle has led them to obesity and has led them from obesity to impaired glucose tolerance and has led them from impaired glucose tolerance to type 2 diabetes. And my job is now to talk to them about drugs and give them protection from cardiovascular disease by better controlling the causes of vascular disease, by targeting the mechanisms involved with newer agents, like I mentioned, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT-2 inhibitors, we can expect an improvement in the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So just because my patient did not follow lifestyle advice in young age, or had a genetic predisposition to obesity, and in spite of following advice, was obese. Can I blame a 15-year-old girl for being obese who walks into my clinic? No, it's genetics, it's epigenetics, it's the obesogenic environment that all of us are facing sitting in front of the computers. So do I deprive her of drugs? 
No, I don't. Yes, I talk about genetics, epigenetics, but I don't say that it is only epigenetics which has led to obesity. I also try to sort it or help her by giving medicine so that I can delay onset of type 2 diabetes and delay onset of cardiovascular risk in the patient with type 2 diabetes. The pill is unavoidable at some stage of life over and above a good lifestyle in spite of your genetics and epigenetics. Thank you.